This is an introductory mathematics talk on Diophantine equations um, originally given to the um, Mathematics Undergraduate Student Association at Berkeley. So I'll start by just giving some examples. So the first one that everyone has come across is Pythagoras's equation x squared plus y squared equals z squared. And you all know the solutions. 3 squared plus 4 squared equals 5 squared. And there's 18, 8 squared plus 15 squared equals 17 squared, and so on. And the point of Diophantine equations is you're given an equation and have to solve it in integers. If you're, we we're trying to solve this in real numbers, it wouldn't be terribly interesting. We just take z to be the square root of x plus y. Um, so, um, a particularly notorious example is Fermat's last theorem. So Fermat changed the exponent here from two to some higher number and asked whether x to the n plus y to the n equals z to the n has any solutions apart from the trivial ones where x or y or z is zero. So here n greater than or equal to three. And he said he had proved there are no further solutions, um, although he probably hadn't. And uh, for a couple of centuries, this was the most notorious open problem in mathematics. It's just Fermat's last theorem until it was finally solved by Andrew Wiles in the mid 90s. Um, so a special case of this is x cubed plus y cubed equals z cubed. And Euler originally showed it had no solutions. And um, what I'm going to do in today's lecture is not show that equations have no solutions, but show how to find solutions. So this isn't a terribly interesting equation because it's got no solutions to find. So instead, we could look at some variation of it, like x cubed plus y cubed equals 9z cubed. And this certainly has a solution 1 cubed plus 2 cubed equals 9 times 1 cubed. And we can ask if it has any other solutions. And if so, how do we find them? Um, so another example of an equation with a curve actually has a singularity, as we will see later, is something like y squared equals x squared plus x cubed. So this has a solution 6 squared equals 3 squared plus 3 cubed, or 24 squared equals 8 squared plus 8 cubed. And again, we can ask, can we find all integer solutions of this? Um, so next example is the number 1,729 is fairly famous for a reason I'll explain a little bit later. Um, and it can be written as a sum of two cubes in two different ways. Um, so you can ask, are there other numbers that can be written as a sum of two cubes in two different ways? So we're trying to solve um, w cubed plus x cubed equals y cubed plus c cubed. And that there are some trivial solutions where w is equal to y or w is minus x or whatever. So we, we want to find non-trivial solutions of this. Um, for example, we could have 2 cubed plus 16 cubed equals 9 cubed plus 15 cubed. And again, we can ask, how can we find solutions of this? Well, one way to find solutions of all these equations is just a kind of stupid one. We could just get a big computer and have it checking every possible case. And um, this would sort of very slowly find solutions like this. But what we want is a, is a sort of lazier way of finding solutions with less effort. Um, and what I'm going to do is show how to find solutions of Diophantine equations by using geometry. And the, the, the geometry makes it much easier to find solutions. So let's look at the first example, Pythagoras's equation. And we can divide it by z squared. So if I put x equals x over z, y equals y over z, then this equation becomes x squared plus y squared equals 1. And you can recognize this as the equation of a circle. So what we're trying to do is to find points on the circle with rational coordinates. So how can we find those systematically? Well, what you can do 
is there's an obvious point with rational coordinates, which is this one, and I guess these four here, which just as coordinates minus one, zero. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to just draw a line through these two. I'm just going to draw the straight line through these. And this straight line has a slope. It's called the slope t. And the slope t is easy to figure out. It's just this distance here divided by this distance here, which is just y over x plus 1. Um, and now we can work out the equation of this line. So this line is, is just the line y equals x plus 1 times t. Um, now you notice t is obviously rational if x and y are rational. So we can say x, y rational implies t is rational. And we can ask the converse. If t is rational, are x and y rational? Um, and you can see the answer is yes without doing any calculations as follows. Um, because this is a circle has a degree two equation. So if you try and find the intersection points, suppose you try and find the x-coordinates of the intersection points of a line in a circle, um, there'll be two intersection points, which are the solution of some quadratic equation. Um, this quadratic equation has, integer, has rational coefficients, and we know one of the roots is rational, so the other root must be rational, because the sum of the roots of a quadratic equation with, in, with rational coefficients is rational. So we know before we do any calculations that if we pick a rational t, then x and y will be rational. Well, now let's actually calculate them. So we, we have y equals x plus 1 times t, and we also know x squared plus y squared equals 1. And if we substitute y into here, we find x squared plus x plus 1 t all squared um, is equal to 1. And now this is a quadratic equation in x. So it has two roots. And one of the roots is minus 1. So it must factorize this as x plus 1 times something. And you can work out what the something else is. It's t squared plus 1 times x plus t squared minus 1 equals 0. So here's the root. Um, x equals minus 1, which corresponds to this point here. And um, here is the other root, which corresponds to this point here. And you see, we can work at what x is. We have x is equal to 1 minus t squared over 1 plus t squared. And y is equal to x plus 1 times t which is 2t over 1 plus t squared. So you can check by algebra now that if t is rational, then x and y are rational. But these are slightly complicated expressions. And we could have found that x, uh, as we said, we don't need to do this calculation to see that x and y are rational. Anyway, we can now find lots and lots of solutions to Pythagoras' equation just by choosing t. For instance, if we choose t equals a half, we find x equals 3 fifths and y equals 4 fifths, which gives us the equation 3 squared plus 4 squared equals 5 squared. If we choose t equals, let's just choose any random rational number, 3 over 11, we find x is equal to um, 56 over 65 and y is equal to 33 over 65, giving us the solution 56 squared plus 33 squared equals 65 squared. And you can obviously generate, effortlessly generate enormous numbers of solutions to this just by picking a rational number t and working out x and y from that. So th this actually gives essentially all solutions of this equation because solutions of this equation more or less correspond to rational numbers t. Um, there's one slight exception. This point here doesn't correspond to a rational number t. It corresponds to the point t equals infinity. But apart from that, we get a one-to-one -one correspondence between solutions of this and rational numbers. So we've got a 
complete description of the solutions. Um, there's, so that's one geometric way of finding solutions. There's actually a second geometric way of finding solutions of this. So we again draw a circle. So, and this time, let's write down a solution. Yes, yeah, suppose we've got some point x1, y1. And let's just look at this angle theta. And suppose we take another solution. And let's call this angle phi. So here we're going to have a solution x2, y2 and you can see this is equal to cosine phi sine phi and this one is of course equal to cosine theta sine theta and now what i'm going to do is i'm just going to add up theta and phi so now i'm going to have this angle here is going to be theta plus phi and the that the coordinates of this point will be cosine theta plus phi, sine theta plus um, phi. And now um, we can use the formulas for the sum of two angles. So um, this root here will just be cosine theta, cosine phi minus sine theta, sine phi, and then we have cosine theta sine phi plus um, sine theta cosine phi. And now what you notice from this is that if all these numbers here are rational, then these numbers here are also rational. So what this means is if we've got a solution x1, y1 and a solution x2, y2 of Pythagoras's equation, then we can find a new solution as follows. So, so we've got... Um, x1, y1 with x1 squared plus y1 squared equals 1. And we've got x2, y2 with x2 squared plus y2 squared equals 1. And now we take this point here, which is the point x1, x2 minus y1, y2, x1, y2 plus x2, y1. And um, if we call this x and this y, then we see that x squared plus y squared will also be 1. So this gives a way of generating new solutions from old solutions using this formula. Notice that algebraically, this formula is a bit mysterious. It's not something you would immediately think of. But if you think of it geometrically, it's obvious what's going on. You're just adding up two angles. Um, for example, we had a solution 3 fifths, 4 fifths. And we had another solution 56 over 65. Um, 33 over 65. And if we take this to be x1, y1, and this to be x2, y2, we can work out this equation here, and it turns out to be 36 over 325, 323 over 325. So we found another solution of Pythagoras's equation, 36 squared plus 323 squared equals 325 squared. And we can obviously carry on doing this and produce more and more larger and larger solutions. Um, incidentally, this shows that the solutions of Pythagoras's equation form a group, um, which means we can sort of, uh, there's a sort of way of adding up two solutions to get a third solution. So here we take this solution and this solution and sort of add them together to get that solution. Um, okay, now let's look at uh, another um, equation. So let's look at the equation y squared equals x squared plus x cubed. So we have solution 6 squared equals 3 squared plus 3 cubed, for example, and we want to find all solutions. And we're going to do it geometrically. So let's draw a graph of y squared equals x squared plus x cubed. And it looks something like this. You sketch it. And you notice there's a sort of funny singular point here. This is called a singularity. 
So a singularity just means a point where things go wrong. So here we've got two, the, the curve is sort of crossing itself. And we also notice there's one obvious solution here, minus one, zero, as well as the solution, zero, zero. Um, and now suppose you've got any other solution. Say we've got a solution x naught, y naught. Well, what can we do with it? Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a line through this and another point. And the most obvious other point to draw the line through is this singularity, because there's obviously something rather special about it. So let's draw the straight line through these two points. And let's try and find the equation of this line. Well, it will have slope is equal to y naught over x naught, which is equal to t. And this is a cubic equation. So we expect every line, every straight line, will generally intersect it in three points. As if we've got a, if we set y equals ax plus b and substitute it in, we'll get a cubic equation for x. So if x naught and y naught are rational, then obviously t is rational. So um, let's just note that down. So x naught, y naught, rational implies t is rational. And the question is, if t is rational, does this mean x naught and y naught are rational? And the answer is yes, because if we fix t, um, we have the equation y equals tx. And if we substitute this in, we will get a cubic equation for x. And two of the roots are already rational because they're zero. So the third root is also rational. So let's just carry this out. So we substitute y equals tx and we get tx squared equals x squared plus x cubed. So we have x cubed plus one minus um, um, t squared x squared equals zero. And here we've got a cubic equation and you can see the roots are pretty obvious. There's a root zero and zero and the other root is um, t squared minus one. And the, 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 the two zero roots, um, we can see them there. They're where this line intersects the, the orange curve in this double point. And you see where it's very useful as a double point here because it means we get two roots that are both zero. Um, so now we can solve this equation. We find x naught is equal to t squared minus one and y naught is equal to t times x naught, which is t times t squared minus one. So here's a way of finding solutions of this equation just by writing down rational numbers. And of course, we want integer solutions. So we might take t to be an integer. For instance, we could take t equals four and we get the solution x equals 15, um, y equals 60. And similarly, you can generate as many solutions as you like. Um, well, that, that cubic equation was particularly easy because it had a double point. Um, what happens if you get a cubic equation without a double point? So let's try the example I mentioned earlier, x cubed plus y cubed equals nine times z cubed. And as before, let's just sketch this to see what's going on. And it looks something like this. It's got a sort of asymptote at y equals minus x, and it ends round like this. So it is x cubed plus y cubed equals nine z cubed. Sorry, I, equals nine. Sorry, I should have said I'm changing. Um, everything by dividing by z cubed. So let's put x equals x over z and y equals y over z. And then we find x cubed plus y cubed equals nine. And we know two points on this because we've got the point one, two and the point two, one. And how can we find other points on this? Well, well, one idea is we could just draw a straight line through these two points, um, but that wouldn't be very interesting because the straight line would just go like that and it would intersect this orange curve at infinity, but it wouldn't have a third intersection point with finite coordinates. So what else can we do? 
Well, if we've got a, a, a point on this curve, let's call its coordinates A, B for the moment. What we can do is we can draw the tangent um, to the orange curve at this point. So it looks something like this. So here we've got a straight line and it intersects this orange curve in three points and it sort of intersects it twice at this point here because it's a tangent vector. You see a tangent vector sort of intersects the curve twice at one point. So as usual, this means the third point of intersection will also have rational coordinates. So we've got this very simple geometric idea. If we take a tangent vector to a solution and find the third point of intersection, it will give us another solution. So let's do this. First of all, we need to work out the coordinates of the tangent line. Well, we work out the slope of the tangent line, which is minus a squared over b squared. And then we can complete the tangent line as x minus a plus b. So it's beginning to look a bit messy. And if we substitute this into this equation here, we find we get x cubed plus minus a squared over b squared x minus a plus b all cubed equals 9. And this is a cubic in x. And it's got three roots. So two of the roots are a, because it intersects this orange curve twice at a. And there must be a third root. Um, well, if you've got a cubic equation, something like a x cubed plus b x squared plus c x plus d equals naught, you know that the product of the roots is going to be minus d over a. Um, so we can work out the third root just by saying the product of a and a in the third root is the, minus the constant term of this divided by the coefficient of x cubed. And if you work this out, it turns out to be minus a cubed plus b cubed or cubed plus 9 b to the 6 divided by b to the 6 minus a to the 6. And then we have to divide by the two roots we thought of. Um, you can simplify this a bit because we know a cubed plus b cubed is equal to um, 9, for example. But anyway, so we have an explicit formula for the third root x. Um, x is now equal to this. And similarly, you can find y. Um, so, for example, so if we found one root, we can now find another. So let's take a, b to be the root we already know about 1, 2. Well, this gives us the root minus 17 over 7, 20 over 7. So we find minus 17 cubed plus 20 cubed equals 9 times 7 cubed. So we found another solution of this. Um, well, there's another way of finding solutions. What we could do instead of taking a tangent line is we can take any two solutions, say this one and this one, and draw the line through these. So this will intersect in a third point. And just as before, if these two points are rational, the coefficients of this green line will be rational. So its intersection with the orange curve will again have rational coordinates. Um, if you do this, the algebra becomes really a bit of a mess. Um, so I'm not actually going to carry it out explicitly, um, but I'll just give an example. So if you take this point and this point, 2 comma 1, and draw the tangent line through them and work out its intersection point, it turns out to be minus 2, 7, 1 over 4, 3, 8, 9, 1, 9 over 4, 3, 8. And this gives us the solution minus 2, 7, 1 cubed plus 9, 1, 9 cubed equals 9 times 4, 3, 8 cubed, which as you see would be a bit tiresome to find by trial and using this geometric argument, it's quite easy to find solutions like this. And obviously you can just keep on doing this um, for as long as your patient holds out. Every time you find a point, you can take the tangent line. 
every time you find two points, you can draw a line through them. So you can generate endless numbers of integer solutions to this equation in a, in a fairly systematic way. Um, so the, um, the, there's actually a famous theorem related to this due to Mordell, which says, suppose you take any reasonable cubic equation, uh, so for instance, y equals x cubed minus x, might look something like this. What you can do um, is, uh, I guess it should go through the origin, never mind, you have to pretend. Yeah, yeah. Um, what you can do is whenever you've got three points on this, on this cubic, whenever you've got two points, you can generate a third point by drawing a line through the, your first two points. Um, this is called the chord tangent process. Or finding solutions because you can either draw a tangent to a point you found or you can draw a chord through two points. Um, and um, it turns out that you actually get um, a, a, something called a group. So I suppose I've got two points P and Q here. Then I get a third point here. And if I, if I change its Y coordinate to minus the Y coordinate, I get another point that I'm going to call P uh, sort of plus Q. It's, it's a funny sort of addition. And it turns out that this funny addition of points behaves, obeys the usual rules of algebra. So P plus Q is obviously equal to Q plus P because the line through P and Q is the same as the line through Q and P. Um, um, slightly more difficult fact is that P plus Q plus R is equal to P plus Q plus R. This is really a total mess to verify because the formula for the coordinates of P plus Q um, are really rather complicated and trying to calculate this explicitly is really rather a headache. Um, there is actually an easier way to prove this without doing explicit calculations, but whatever. So um, what we get is a sort of funny addition of points which obeys the usual rules of algebra and Poincaré asked this question, can you find a finite number of rational points on any cubic so that all rational points can be obtained from this finite number by, by using this operation? And Mordell showed the answer is yes. He showed the rational points are finitely generated. In other words, you can find a finite number of rational points such that all the other rational points are generated from these by the chord tangent process. Um, so, um, so uh, now we get, we're, so far we've been looking at curves. Now I'm going to look at an example of a surface. So this is related to Ramanujan's famous number. Uh, so there's a famous mathematical anecdote about this. Um, this appears in Hardy's book on Ramanujan. So I have here a copy of Hardy's book. <clears throat> and on page 12, he has, he, he has this anecdote that I'll just read out. So Hardy says, I remember to go, going to see him once when he was lying ill in Putney. So he's, he's talking about Ramanujan, of course. I had ridden in taxi cab number 1729 and remarked that the number seemed to me a rather dull one and that I hoped it was not an unfavorable omen. No, he replied, it is a very interesting number. It is the smallest number expressible as the sum of two cubes in two different ways. I asked him naturally whether he would tell me the solution of the corresponding problem for fourth powers and he replied after a moment's thought that he knew no obvious examples and supposed the first such number must be very large. So as a result of this story, this, this particular number 1729 has become really famous. It's even got its own Wikipedia article if you want to read about it. Um, so um, what I'm going to do is show how to find other examples of numbers with this property. So we want to solve a cubed plus b cubed equals c cubed plus d cubed. And obviously we want non-trivial solutions where a isn't equal to c or d and 
it's not equal to minus b and so on. Um, you can rearrange this by changing the sign of c and d. Um, so, uh, we, so it becomes a bit more symmetrical. So it looks like that. And now we can just divide by d cubed. So let's put x equals a over d, y equals b over d, and z equals c over d. So we get x cubed plus y cubed plus c cubed equals one. Um, so this is a bit like the earlier equation we had x cubed plus y cubed equals nine, except now we've got three variables. And this is now the equation of a surface in real three-dimensional space. And we're trying to find points on this surface with rational coordinates. Um, and now we can do a similar trick that we did with cubic curves. Let's take two points, P and Q, and draw a line through them. And this line will usually intersect this cubic surface in another point. So R is the intersection point. of this line and the surface x cubed plus y cubed plus c cubed equals one, assuming it line intersects this. Occasionally the line would just be asymptotic to it, but we will ignore that problem. And now just as before, if p and q have rational coordinates, then the equation of this line will have rational coordinates. So the third intersection point with this surface will also have rational coordinates. So this will be a rational point. OK, well, let's try this. First of all, we notice this equation has lots of obvious solutions, like it's got x cubed plus minus x cubed plus 1 cubed equals 1 cubed. And it's got um, y cubed plus 1 cubed plus minus y cubed equals 1 cubed, and 1 cubed plus c cubed plus minus c cubed equals one cubed. So these are the um, obvious, not very interesting solutions. Um, and we can ask what happens if we take two of these boring solutions and do this process, we draw the line through them and take the third intersection point. And the answer is you get a third uninteresting solution. So if you take a point on with satisfying this and a point satisfying this and carry out this process, we just get a point here. So that's not terribly interesting. However, We've got um, a more interesting solution, minus 9 cubed plus minus 10 cubed plus 12 cubed um, plus 1 equals 0. Um, so um, I guess it should be a minus 1 there. Never mind. Um, so. Uh, what happens if we do this? Well, let's just see. So let's take the point P to be 1 minus 1 minus 1. And we're going to let this be correspond to a rational number T being naught. And at T equals 1, we're going to let it be the point Q, which is equal to minus 9 minus 10, 12. And now we're going to draw the line through these points, and it will be the set of points 1 minus 10t, minus 1 minus 9t, minus 1 plus 13t. So this is a line through p and q, because you can see it's a line parameterized by t, and it goes through p and q when t is 0 or 1. So this is going to be our third point r. And now, we, we want the sum of these three numbers cubed. We want x cubed plus y cubed plus c cubed plus 1 to be equal to 0. So we get 1 minus 10t cubed plus minus 1 minus 9t cubed plus minus 1 plus 13t cubed equals 1. So plus 1 plus 0. I keep getting that the wrong way around. 
Um, and you can see that it has three roots. Uh, it has roots t equals zero or t equals one. And the third root um, is going to be rational and you can work it out explicitly by doing some calculation. It turns out to be minus one over 26 in this case. So we now find our point R is equal to 36 over 26 minus 17 over 26 minus 39 over 26. Um, so we get a solution 36 cubed plus 26 cubed equals 17 cubed plus 39 cubed. So we've got another solution to Ramanujan's equation. Um, and um, um, obviously you can keep generating more and more solutions by just drawing a line through any two solutions you've got. Um, incident, you can ask if you get a group like this, and the answer is you don't, because if the points P and Q are equal, you think you would take the tangent line to P and Q. But the trouble is, if you've got a point of a surface, it doesn't have a tangent line, it has a tangent plane. So you don't really know which line tangent to it to take. So you can't really define an addition operation on points because this breaks down if the two points are the same. Um, so, um, in general, what happens for plane curves um, is if you've got a plane, if you've got a curve, then it might have degree two. And if you've got a plane curve of degree two, it acts rather like the equation x squared plus y squared equals one. If we can find one rational point on it, then we can find all the other rational points very easily just by drawing a line through both points. If we've got a degree three curve, such as x cubed plus y cubed equals nine, then um, this is an example of something called an elliptic curve, um, unless it happens to be singular, such as the curve y squared equals x squared plus x cubed. Um, so singular elliptic curves with singularities behave a bit like degree two curves. Elliptic curves without singularities behave like the degree three curve we had that you, Mordell showed you can find a finite number of points that generate all of them. Um, what about degree curves of degree greater than three? So if you have something like this, um, then um, curves of degree greater than three generally only have a finite number of rational points on them. This is a very deep theorem proved by Faltings a few decades ago. It was originally conjectured by Mordell. So anyway, we, we, we turns out that curves split up into three different groups. There are those for which the rational points are really easy to find, an infinite in number, usually. Um, then we get elliptic curves where the rational points are at least finitely generated. And then we get all the other curves where there are only a finite number of rational points and they seem to be very hard to find. Um, these differ by something called the genus. We say these curves have genus zero, these curves have genus one, and these curves have genus greater than one. And the genus turns out to be what happens if you take the curve over complex numbers, which gives you a surface, and then the surface has a number of sphere with a number of handles and the number of handles is the genus. So we've got this really weird relation between the topology of a complex curve and the complexity of the number of points on it. Okay, I think I'll just finish by giving a suggestion for further reading if you want to find out more about this. Um, there's an introductory book called Undergraduate Algebraic Geometry by Miles Reed and the early chapter on it explains um, this method of generating um, rational points on cubics. So here chapter two is on cubics and the group law and he explains this method of generating new points from old points in rather more detail. Okay, I think that's all for this lecture. <laughs>